as a new virus from China continues to spread around the world, so does fear as we try to get ahead of and learn more about the coronavirus. So far, Johns Hopkins reports 2,941 people have died worldwide and 86,000 people have been infected, including right here in the Bay Area, as just mentioned. Joining me now to either ease or raise more concerns is president of San Francisco-based biotech company, Distributed Bio, Dr. Jacob Glanville. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me on. So you've been getting a lot of tension lately for many reasons, the vaccines that you're developing, a growing curiosity about viruses, plus you're featured in a Netflix documentary series called Pandemic, How to Prevent an Outbreak that was eerily released within days of the coronavirus, stealing both lives and headlines. So what do you make of this timing? Is it just a prime example of how quickly a virus can sweep the globe? You know, people have asked me about that. Uh, if I were to make this documentary, I would have released it around the time of flu season. Um, of course, we couldn't have expected it was going to be released around the, the, the same period as this outbreak. But the thing to keep in mind is that outbreaks happen pretty frequently. We had the African swine fever. We've had Ebola outbreaks. Um, we've had avian flu. It, you know, this one's particularly scary, but uh, it's not uncommon for there to be new pathogens that sweep across a human population. There are reports that the coronavirus is slowing down in China, but in just the last few hours, looking at this interactive map from Johns Hopkins University, the number of global infections has jumped from about 85 to more than 86,000 in the last day. Uh, where do you think we're at in the fight against this outbreak? Yeah, so the good news is that the, the Chinese government, the people, and the medical uh, experts in, in China did a really good job of slowing down the uh, the continued growth of the outbreak there. The bad news is that coronavirus, uh, this particular um, COVID-19, uh, it, it has a long incubation period. So people could be carrying around for two weeks with showing almost no symptoms where they're also infectious. Uh, and and that, that is problematic because it means people can travel to other countries. And so we're starting to see significant outbreaks in Europe with Italy being in particular uh, affected, but also there's a city in Germany that's under quarantine um, Mecca pilgrimages have been suspended. They're considering suspending the Olympics. Um, you have in the Middle East a significant outbreak with Iran, many of the neighboring countries around China. And in the United States, we are realizing because of uh, uh, some problems with a kit that was distributed to try to detect the coronavirus, as well as policies around who should get tested, that we probably are dramatically underestimating the number of, of cases that are already in the, the communities. And the reason we, we think we, that this is the case not only are we not testing, so therefore certainly there's something going on we're not seeing, but we're starting to see cases pop up where the, that person had no known association with someone who was sick or, or traveled to uh, countries that are affected, which means that they got it from somewhere else in the community, which means there's more people that we don't know about that are infected. And we're also seeing now a travel ban put in place just today with uh, President Trump saying that he's going to be restricting travel from Iran, but also there's um, an advisory to uh, refrain from traveling to certain regions of now Italy and South Korea because they are seeing a really a high number of cases there. So um, given how new this is and how far the coronavirus has spread, are people being hysterical or is there some real reason to be nervous and scared? Well, it's a mixed bag. Uh, it is going to most likely outbreak across most of the globe at this point because there's that two week delay. The areas where we see the disease is a manifestation of, of a problem of infection that happened a week or two weeks before. And many of those people have traveled. It's easier than it's ever been to travel around the world. So, so that's the bad news. It, this thing is getting out. Um, the good news is that children um, you know, under age nine are, and, and even under age 19 are really not that affected by this. But the bad news is that it's older people are disproportionately dying and having very dis severe disease. So anyone over 80, for instance, uh, I think about 15% of them are going to die if they get infected. That, that's that's a problem for specific demographics. Like I would con be concerned about retirement homes um, and you know, cruise ships, groups that where there's a large number of elder people that might be infecting each other. That That is quite dangerous. That's exactly what we just saw today over in Oregon uh, or Washington state, actually, where it was a, a senior home in which we've learned that uh, an elderly woman ended up spreading that disease to a healthcare worker, which is now a problem because people who are treating this are now more vulnerable, so they have to protect themselves as well. 
Um, going back to your documentary pandemic, you're developing a universal vaccine for the flu, and now the federal government is working on a coronavirus vaccine, but they estimate that that won't be available for another year and a half or so. What can you tell us about the work and the time that goes into producing a vaccine and why it would take that long to see this distributed among the public? Sure, so I'll talk about the various efforts to create a vaccine. We're working on flu. My company is working on an antibody for, for COVID-19 treatment, but not a vaccine because other groups are already doing that. Um, the standard process of making a vaccine is you, you, know, you develop the components, you test it in animals, and then once you have sufficient proof of, of safety, you, produce, you manufacture it, which can take quite a long time, often 18 months, although there's ways to accelerate that. And then you have to enter human phase trials. So you first give it to a group of people. Uh, it's called phase one. And there you're just asking safety. You're not even asking if the drug works. You're just asking in healthy people, does this drug cause a problem? And then after that, you go to phase two, which is a larger study. And then there, there you're testing for how efficacious or how effective the medicine is. Then a phase three study. Then you finally approve the drug. That whole process normally could take seven years easily. Uh, the good news in an outbreak, there's a couple strategies that could greatly accelerate the release of a medicine. And there's companies that are doing this. There's a group called Moderna. They have uh, extremely quickly produced a vaccine. It's a, tr it's a test vaccine, so it has not been proven to work yet. Um, but they were able to manufacture it in a few months by using an RNA-based vaccine technology. Um, there are also ways you could accelerate that, those testing steps. So um, in cancer research, we have a mixture of a phase one slash two, where they could basically give the, the medicine to a group of subjects where you're, you're testing safety, but those people are also at high risk of the disease. So you end up getting some of that information of the phase two as well. And then as we've done with Ebola and other outbreaks, it's possible to distribute your phase two or your phase three to a much larger group of people. So normally for financial reasons, you'd give it to like 200 people. But if you found that there was evidence of efficacy and you're in a medical crisis, you could end up handing it out to a much larger group of people under compassionate use. So those, those things would make it not have to take a year and a half. They could accelerate. And I can guarantee you the uh, Moderna is working towards that goal. I understand there's a yeast based vaccine being produced in China, and I'm sure they're going to not wait a year and a half to distribute it. And then the NIH is also producing a vaccine and they, they have multiple mechanisms to accelerate its release to the population. Now, all of that said, you can't make a, a drug instantly. I heard a report of a company claiming they produced a, you know, an animal, uh, vaccine in three hours, and that's just nonsense. It's uh, marketing. So we do have a period right now where we do not have a medicine to treat, treat this outbreak. And so we're also hearing from medical professionals that people shouldn't rely on the release of uh, a vaccine for the coronavirus. They're saying, you know, just do the standard, wash your hands thoroughly as much as possible and wipe down surfaces with uh, anti-sanitizing wipes. Uh, is that basically all we can do? They're also now telling people to limit um, contact with others. That's kind of worrisome, too, because, I mean, what are we going to do? Just hermit ourselves? Yeah. So, uh I'll say some good news. There's some a little bit of a scary biology thing we should keep in mind, but in general, there's some good news here. Um, first, they are testing a series of old drugs, a, a drug called chloroquine, which has been out for 70 years to treat malaria, and it's shown in a petri dish. It slows down the virus, and there's a report in China where they tested on 100 subjects that those subjects did better than those who did not receive it, but we still are waiting for the, the full set of evidence to be released. Um, there's also a drug from... Gilead was a failed drug for Ebola, but they're trying it here. And then there's an antiviral cocktail for HIV that's also being tested. So any of those three uh, cases would be our fastest approach. That would actually be more desirable than a vaccine initially, because a vaccine, if, even if it works, takes many weeks to take effect, where you can give these medicines to someone who's sick or to a medical care professional and protect them from getting sick. So we may be in a position of having those results out in, in three to four weeks. And that really is our fastest route towards having an effective treatment. Now, in the meantime, the advice they're giving everyone, because there is no medicine right now, is uh, wash your hands, maintain social distance, um, which basically means don't hang out with sick people, and in general, don't go hang out at cr crowded areas. Uh, that advice is important in areas where you know you have a decent risk of infection. Uh, if you're in Italy, and it's particularly in the affected areas, yeah, you'd want to go stay home. And I think those sort of social distancing measures has, has been what's really helped the Chinese uh, reduce the proliferation of the virus and the outbreak. They, they quarantined 57 million people. So it is a testament to the 
their ability to go perform these sorts of very aggressive actions that we they, they did slow the release of this pathogen up elsewhere to the world and we, we owe them thanks for that um, for us in the meantime wash your hands uh, avoid contacting try to avoid touching your face all the time I, I get asked about these masks if you're in an area with a lot of affected people it makes sense to wear those masks um, it is true that the masks don't cover all the virus doesn't it doesn't stop it from getting in on the sides even in the in 95 so you don't place them very carefully but that's not the only way a mask is effective um they've done studies where they show that parents who wear a mask when they're treating a child with influenza is 70 percent less likely to get influenza from their child and i think the main reason is you're not touching your face anymore and it also creates social distance because someone looks at you and they back away um but but again i don't think everyone like it's not the case that everyone in america needs to start wearing masks right now this is really just uh, I would say if you are traveling, so you're in, in airplanes and in places where lots of other people are touching surfaces but with people that may be affected, that's something to consider. Or if you're in an area with a known outbreak. What would you say to people who are probably now thinking about canceling their spring or summer trips because of this? Yeah, it depends where you're going. So the things that... I, I, I still have been planning to do travel I, for my work. I, I was at Washington, D.C. to meet up with DARPA a few weeks ago, and, and I will continue to do um, travel. I have not worn a mask at this point, but as it progresses, that may make sense to me. I have a five-month-old at home, and even though it doesn't appear to be that risky for children, I don't. I am an asthmatic, and I don't want to risk that at home, so I may do that. If I was planning to get on a vacation you know, to Italy, uh, yeah, I would I would go somewhere else just because it's a, it's a hot zone, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. Now, again... All this being said, this is not as lethal as SARS or Ebola. Um, this is a severe disease. You know, about one in five people is, is going to get severely sick and need to go to an ICU. Um, but if you're young, uh, your chances of, of, of dying from this is quite low. It's really the older populations that are at high risk from this. So you want to, like, I would, I would definitely advise against my grandmother going anywhere vacationing where there's a decent outbreak of this because it, it could be life-threatening. Um, we're seeing a lot of people panicking and also taking aggressive measures with the coronavirus to stop the spread. But as we mentioned, uh, the flu is really widespread in and of itself and has claimed many lives here in the United States. Why do you think that we're seeing these measures being taken with the coronavirus? Well, partially it's new. We're used to the flu, so we put up with the fact that it kills so many people every year. You could easily lose 50,000 people a year in a flu season. Um, there are some differences. So for the flu, even though the vaccines um, aren't perfect, we have, a, we have vaccines and we also have antivirals. So there are medicines that can be used to treat flu patients. Whereas for the coronavirus, we, we don't have any treatment for COVID-19 at this point. Um, the, the, other, the other issue is that COVID-19 is, is more deadly. Um, about one in a thousand people that get the flu uh, could end up dying. We're, we're looking at about 2% um, the, for folks, folks that get COVID-19 that can end up dying. So that, that makes it more dangerous. Uh, it's also an outbreak of um, a little bit unknown to, to which the degree to which it can outbreak rapidly. And that's a concern because we have experience knowing how many people could end up in ICUs with the flu on a typical season where this thing could outbreak very rapidly and eventually uh, overwhelm uh, medical establishments and ICUs, and we just don't know how severe that is. So it's a little bit of planning, preparation, additional severity, and then the novelty, I think, freaks people out because you know what the flu is, and you adapt to it and get used to it, where the idea of some new, you know, icky infection scares people. When do you think that this kind of panic will die down? I think people get panic fatigue, so I think there's going to be, I heard today and yesterday there was uh, a number of people going and stocking up food. Um, at their houses. You know, that's, it's not a bad idea to have some extra food at your house in case there's an earthquake or whatnot, but uh, it's premature at this point to worry at that level. Um, so I feel like what I think would really help people calm down is if the um, local governments and federal governments took a series of um, firm actions to improve surveillance. I think that would help really well really understand the extent of the problem here in the United States and then um, be able to um, act to limit the outbreak once um, uh, hot spots or, or groups of infected individuals were identified. At this point right now, our surveillance network is not well established, so we're operating without good information on to what degree there's already been a spread of the virus in the United States. Can you explain the surveillance in the medical use and then also um, just say basically what that entails? Sure. So the, the reason we have 
a sense of how many people are infected in various countries is that they have a, a test that can be run on someone's saliva or sputum um, to, to determine whether or not they have been infected. And this is called a qPCR test. It directly tests for the, the genetic information from the virus. Um, and that test, the one that's done in many other countries, is different than the one that was released by the CDC some weeks ago. That the CDC a test had been built to detect not just the uh, COVID-19 uh, SARS-CoV-2, the novel virus, but it also tested a number of other viruses. So they produced it because they wanted to be able to say, okay, it's not that, it's flu or it's something else. I get the idea, but the problem was there was a flaw in the test. And so they distributed it out to many groups. Um, a number of different groups identified um, irregularities in the test results. And so then at that point, there were only a couple sites in the United States that were allowed to conduct these tests. Uh, and additionally, there were some rules in place that we should only run that test on, on a subject who'd come back from initially China and then from other infected countries. And the problem with that is that the, the community case here in California, not that far from me, they didn't test that person for about a week, even though the doctors were asking to test them because that person had not been to China or other infected countries. So they didn't meet the criteria. But you understand that's a terrible criteria because uh, you're you're not going to be able to detect the thing you really care about, which is community spread. According to that rule, you only test people who come back from China or are or, or, or citizens of China. Now, so that, that's the problem with the surveillance. They're making steps to alter the surveillance rules now um, and put in place our ability to just really detect, monitor, and determine who's infected and how many people in our community and which communities are affected. What kinds of lessons do you think uh, people and medical professionals will be taking away from this event? Well, we learn every time. That's the good news. We're, you know, we're, we were faster with HIV than we were in diseases previous. We were faster with Ebola than we were with HIV, and we're faster now. We're better than we've ever been at responding quickly to novel pathogens and viral threats. Um, it would be nice if we didn't have to, you know, run through these emergency drills every time. So I think the things that we're learning this time and we'll be better prepared for, for going forward is it's essential to have good surveillance networks. It's essential that we have um, uh, open sharing of information. I think that's been a continued theme. The Chinese early on struggled with sharing effective information and in the outbreak. I think uh, Iran, there's some concerns. In the United States, we have similar concerns about transparency. And it really is to everybody's benefit, the collective human global population, that we're all extremely transparent and uh, about the, to what degree the, out, the, out, the outbreak is affecting local areas because we're, you know, as you can see, this stuff can spread to other countries. And so we, it makes the most sense for us to all coordinate. Uh, on a brighter note, science, scientists have done an extremely good job of coordinating internationally, sharing sequences and structures and assays and the ability to grow the virus and, and study it. And I think that's been a testament to the acceleration of the biotechnology community um, as we all race towards creating effective medicines here. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Glanville, for joining us and shedding some light about the coronavirus. Sure. Thanks for having me on. You're watching Cron On, the Bay Area streaming news 24-7.